Hello students, Mr. Martyrone speaking to you. We're going to finish up our unit on World War I with a little flip video. Turn to your packets. You need to be looking at, we're going to start with question number 20. Uh, we've got up to 19 in class. We're going to finish question 20. Describe Woodrow Wilson's 14 points plan. Uh, then we'll look at number 21 about the armistice. And we'll talk about the troubled peace process and some of the long-term effects following uh, the end of World War I. So, Let's get started. We know that the turning point of the war was when the Americans enter. And from that, Woodrow Wilson crafts what he calls the 14 points. And this is Woodrow Wilson's peace plan. And I will give you some of the most important ones. Number one, he called for a League of Nations. He said the best way to prevent from any future conflict from arising is to have some sort of League of Nations where people and nations can come together and hammer out their differences before an armed conflict begins. This is a precursor to the United Nations. All right, This is a big deal. It's the big sticking point for the 14 points. He also called for an end to secret treaties. Remember, it's these treaties and alliances that really were the catalyst for World War I in, in the first place. The third thing, the third main idea in Woodrow Wilson's 14 points was that he called for free trade and freedom of the seas so that no neutral nation will be targeted or torpedoed during war. He also called for a reduction in arms. Uh, we saw prior to World War I, we saw that the countries of Europe were increasing their defense spending and military spending. Well, now the uh, opposite idea is in play, where he is encouraging countries to reduce their arms. And the big, pro uh, the big thing here is self-determination. The last point here is that Woodrow Wilson wants the countries of the former Austrian-Hungarian Empire to kind of be able to determine their own fate and determine their own futures as to what kind of country they want to be. So over here on the left-hand side of the screen is a photograph of Woodrow Wilson's actual shorthand document. Um, when he was dictating the 14 points to his secretary, she wrote in a series of bumps and squiggles and lines, and this is a lost art, uh, but it's almost using like T9 on your phone or auto uh, autofill when you're typing. Uh, these bumps and squiggles and lines represent not only whole words, but whole phrases. So this is uh, kind of the big highlight of Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, and he's coming uh, to uh, at the end of the war. This is his big plan. So the war ends. The Allies, and this you want to get down for uh, your final notes. In July of 1918, the Allies launch their final assault. This is a huge counteroffensive assault, and it is successful. It drives the Germans back, back through Belgium, back into Germany. Um, as a result, the Axis powers begin to crumble. Kaiser Wilhelm II is exiled to the Netherlands. The Austrian-Hungary and the Ottoman empires collapse in disarray, and finally, at a fitting moment, at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in the year 1918, the armistice is signed. November 11th, 1918, at 11 a.m., the war officially is over. All right, so that song you saw or heard was Taps, and that's played when soldiers um, – it's the last call of the night when you're in the Army. Uh, they also play it at soldiers' funerals. Nine million lives were lost, American lives were lost as a result. Um, and then that takes us to the troubled peace prop process, and this is uh, question number 23 in part five, the troubled peace. All right, so – this is point number one. There are four nations, Great Britain, France, and Italy, and the United States. They're all the winners in World War I, and they all get to set up the terms of the peace agreement. The second point you want to get down 
for number 23, is that Russia is shut out of the peace process and they lose their territory. All right. Woodrow Wilson is forced to compromise on his 14 points and Germany was harshly punished. All right. So take a minute, get those four points down under question 23. They are important. I'm going to explain some of them right now. So we saw, we know that Great Britain, France, and Italy, the United States are the victors in World War I. Russia shows up to the peace conference expecting to play a role in peace. However, the allies tell them, listen, you sign an agreement with Germany. You're no longer in our peace process. All right. Woodrow Wilson uh, also shows up very idealistic about his hopes for a lasting peace and is shut down. A lot of the European nations say, listen, United States, our countries were devastated by war. It is time for Germany to be punished as a result. It's kind of the old pottery barn rule. If you break it, you buy it. Well, France and Great Britain were arguing, listen, Germany broke France. They broke Great Britain. They need to pay. So Germany is harshly punished as a result of the war. This isn't a peace process as much as it's, it's getting back at Germany for what they did. And this right there, that last point is so important because that's going to be the real seeds of World War II. And here's a cartoon of Woodrow Wilson coming home from, uh, from the League of Nations after he was forced to compromise on his treaty. So as a result, the League of Nations is created, and the United States does not join. And guys, this is a question, if you're following along, this is 24 in our notes. Germany is punished. They are stripped and disarmed of their colonies. Germany must pay what are called war reparations. They must pay back the countries. They must pay back the United States, France, Great Britain, and all the and Italy and all the other countries destroyed and ravaged by the war. And territories that were once controlled by Austria, Hungary, Germany, and Russia were given their independence. So a total of nine new countries will emerge after World War I. So the political landscape of Europe will dramatically be changed. Um, the first point that the United States doesn't create, uh, join the League of Nations, that's huge. Um, the League of Nations was Woodrow Wilson's baby. Uh, Woodrow Wilson campaigned for this uh, when he got home to the United States because the United States Senate had to ratify the treaty. Um, unfortunately, the Senate does not agree with the League of Nations. They think it takes some of their war-making ability or powers from them. So while Woodrow Wilson is campaigning and lobbying to the United States to join the League of Nations, he actually suffers a stroke and becomes incapacitated uh, for the last like year and a half of his presidency. As a result, the United States doesn't join. Also, there's two other countries that are not invited to join the League of Nations, and this is uh, question 25. The three big countries that don't join the League are the United States, Germany, and Russia. And a lot of people believe that had those three nations joined the League of Nations under the Treaty of Versailles, um, you would not have had World War II. Things would have been drastically and dramatically more different going in to the 1920s and 1930s. But you had a Treaty of Versailles that harshly punished Germany and disarmed them of everything. And now when you have Hitler rising in the 1930s, Hitler will rearm and begin to break the Treaty of Versailles, which dives the war into World War II. So here's a map of Europe in 1914 on the eve of war. Pay careful attention to this part of the map. We've got Russia, Austria-Hungary, and the German Empire. Well, now the map of Europe is dramatically changed. Russia has lost substantial territory. There's now Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. Germany is now shrunk in size. Now you have Czechoslovakia, which no longer exists, fun fact, as a country, no longer exists. It's now the Czech Republic, and then there is Slovakia. The Austrian-Hungary Empire, take a look there. The big, mighty Austria-Hungary Empire is now broken into two separate countries. There's the country of Austria, and there's the country of Hungary. And then on the Balkan Peninsula, Yugoslavia um, kind of unites all these countries here. Bulgaria and Romania also uh, gain territory there. Uh, and the Ottoman Empire is no more. Down here in green, they're now the country of Turkey. So the map of Europe is redrawn dramatically uh, to, to include the idea of self-determination there. 
And now question 26, the long-term effect of the war. It, Europe really gets a, just a string of bad luck. In 1918, Europe is devastated not only by the war, but there's a flu epidemic that breaks out. As a result, the United States economy emerges as the strong creditor nation, and this will set up uh, the stage for the United States to be a world player in the 1920s and the Roaring Twenties. Russia becomes a communist state as a result. And then the last big point that you want to get down, and this is this is really the whole ball game, because the German economy is so weak and feeble, it gives rise to a totalitarian government in the 1930s under Adolf Hitler. And that we're going to see next week uh, when we talk about the 1920s and 30s when Hitler rises into power and really begins to shape and dramatically alter um, the balance of power in Europe. So we've done questions 23, 24, 25, 26, and you have a chart for 27. Uh, you need to look over these notes in preparation for your quiz and your chapter test on World War I. If you have any questions, you can post them onto Edmodo. If you need to go back and view this, this uh, presentation again, you can. Uh, you post any questions you have on our class wall. And thank you for watching.